Now I'd like to talk about how we can theoretically understand how a capacitor is going to respond to a voltage across the plates. And we'll see if the model that I said before of a capacitor being characterized by some capacitance C is a realistic model based on what we understand about electric fields and the energy stored in electric fields. So recall the capacitor is constructed of parallel plates with opposite charges, a plus and a minus. The charge density is the charge per area on the two plates. The positive plate is going to have a charge density of plus sigma. The negative plate will have a charge density of minus sigma. Outside, there's no electric field. Inside, the electric field between the plates has a strength of sigma over epsilon naught, and that's a uniform field. The plate separation is lowercase d, just to say that it's a small distance. The potential difference between the plates is the work per unit charge to push a charge from one plate to the next. So if we're going to push a charge from the minus plate to the positive plate, we're going to be pushing it against a force of the electric field E times the charge Q. We have to push it a distance D, so the work done is DEQ. The potential is just that work per unit charge, so that's just going to be DE. Here, I've substituted the electric field strength, sigma over epsilon naught, for E. And now we're just going to substitute Q over A for the charge density. The capacitance, recall, is the charge separated on the plates, divided by the voltage required to do that. So that's Q over V. We've just made an expression for delta V. So recall, when you're dividing by a fraction, you multiply by its reciprocal. So this capacitance from Q, A epsilon naught, divided by DQ. We can simplify that by factoring out the Q in the numerator and the denominator, and we end up with epsilon naught A over D. So the capacitance of a capacitor is directly proportional to the area of the plates and inversely proportional to the distance between the plates. This makes sense if you think about it. The larger the area on the plates, the more you can separate the positive charges from each other and the negative charges from each other, so it doesn't have as much repulsion. The closer the plates are together, the more the positive charges are attracted to the negative charges, and that's a stabilizing interaction, because if you think about it, you're not separating the charges that far. So the work done to separate isn't that much. So you can have more of a charge separation over a capacitor with larger plates and a smaller separation between the plates. So to summarize what we just said, a slightly different way to look at it, if we have plate area A, separation D, then the field between the plates is sigma over epsilon naught, or Q over the area times epsilon naught. The potential is the field times D, so we just multiply that by the plate separation. And then the capacitance is Q divided by that potential, A epsilon naught over D. In practice, it's very rare to have a capacitor that's got a vacuum between the plates. There's a couple reasons for that. One is if you have a charge on these two plates, they're going to try to attract each other. And it's going to be very hard to keep the capacitor made of parallel plates, two parallel plates that are electrically attracting each other, separated. Um, you don't want there to be an electrical contact between the two because then the charge will just flow from one plate to the other and your capacitor will be destroyed. If you fill the space between the plates with a polarizable insulator, known as a dielectric, um, then what will happen is as you develop the electric field from having the positive and negative charges on the two plates, then that will cause an electrical polarization of the charges within the insulator. So the negative charges are going to align so that they're closer to the positive plate, and the positive charges are going to align so that they're closer to the negative plate. This reduces the electric field between the plates, and it stabilizes the charge on the plate, so it makes it easier to have a charge on the plates. What that will do is mean that you can have more charge on the plates at a lower potential. That's going to be increasing the capacitance of the capacitor. This is often characterized by a dielectric constant, kappa, which is characteristic of the particular material that the dielectric is made out of. And the kappa is defined this way, that if the capacitance of the capacitor, if you don't have the dielectric, if it's just a vacuum, if the capacitance is C, then with the dielectric, you're going to increase the capacitance by a factor kappa. The dielectric constant kappa is the factor by which the dielectric 
increases the capacitance of a capacitor. What are the characteristics of a dielectric? Well, it's got to be a good electrical insulator, and it should be polarizable to allow for a high dielectric constant. So it's an insulator that polarizes. What it does is it reduces the field between the plates, makes it less work to separate the charges, giving the capacitor a higher capacitance. Another term given for the dielectric constant is the relative permittivity, because recall epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space, or the permittivity of a vacuum, then the dielectric can have a permittivity as well. And the relative permittivity is the ratio between the permittivity of the dielectric and the permittivity of the vacuum. The formula for capacitance, then, is going to be quite similar to the formula that we had with free space as the dielectric with the vacuum dielectric. It's just that now we have the permittivity of the dielectric in the formula instead of the permittivity of the vacuum. Any material that's not a vacuum is going to have a dielectric constant higher than 1, because anything is going to polarize more than a vacuum will. So the vacuum has the lowest possible permittivity. An additional consideration with capacitors is what voltage you can take the capacitor to. If you have a really strong field between the plates, well, then that can separate charges on its own. That's what fields do. They move positive charges in one direction and negative charges in the other direction. If the field is very, very strong, that'll actually rip electrons out of their orbitals, out of their atoms and molecules that they're associated with. And as you know, the electrons are what holds the material together. So if that happens, if the positive or negative charges can actually move, then dielectric becomes a conductor. Dielectric is supposed to be an insulator, once charges can move, it's a conductor, and your capacitor has no capacity anymore. Usually when this happens, uh, when a, the dielectric breaks down, there's permanent damage to the material. It actually becomes a different material and it no longer works. You've fried your dielectric. The possibility of dielectric breakdown limits how thin you can make the dielectric layer. Recall, the thinner the dielectric, the higher the capacitance. So what you often want to do is make that separation very small, make that dielectric really thin. But if you make the dielectric too thin, then you'll have dielectric breakdown at fairly low voltages, and that will render your capacitor useless. So here is a list of some common dielectrics. There are many others that are used, characterized by both their dielectric constant, that's the relative permittivity, and their dielectric strength. The dielectric strength we see is in uh, units of kilovolts per millimeter, a unit of electric field, actually. So this tells you the electric field that will cause a dielectric breakdown. Kilovolts per millimeter is also megavolts per meter. A volt per meter is the same unit as a newton per coulomb. Air has a fairly small dielectric constant, very similar to free space. Dielectric strength is 3 kilovolts per millimeter. So that means that if you have a 1 millimeter gap, it's going to require about 3 kilovolts to get a spark. Paper has a pretty high dielectric constant and a pretty high dielectric strength. Teflon, a little lower in dielectric constant, but a higher dielectric strength than paper. Mica, not that great in terms of dielectric constant. It's pretty good. Um, very high dielectric strength. One of the really nice things about mica as a dielectric material is that it can be found in very thin, very flat sheets. So it's a very uniform material and it makes it an excellent dielectric in that sense. Titanium dioxide has a very high dielectric constant. It's very polarizable. It doesn't have that much dielectric strength, however. Um, silica is even better than mica. It has a moderate dielectric constant, but a very high dielectric strength. In other words, it's very hard to create dielectric breakdown in silica.